Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'll do some introductions. Uh, my name is Marcia Quinn. I'm co-executive director for Parent to Parent USA. Thank you for joining us along with Jonathan Martinez from BBI as part of our partnership with them. We're putting on a quarterly webinar series on a very hot topic, supported decision making. And if you don't know Jonathan, he's what I call the guru on this subject matter and um, great the way he presents his webinars in such a uh, conversational way and um, it'll be easy re to relate to. This re will be recorded. There will be an evaluation following it. We have scheduled one and a half hours. Um, we will we'll likely get done with it earlier than that. Um, if you do have any questions, go to the bottom and rather than in the chat box, place your questions under Q&A. If uh, we have the opportunity, I will stop and interrupt Jonathan and ask questions or we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. Um, so I, the topic healthcare and life planning, I, I reflected upon myself and for me, Jonathan, this is really timely. I have a 22 year old and a 19 year old both on the autism spectrum. So we're doing a lot of transition to adulthood with a lot of their medical information and healthcare. And we're also doing um, a lot of some tough conversations about what we're going to do, especially with one of my sons, about housing and and life, you know, long-term life changes and and um, housing options. So this is really pertinent to me, and I hope uh, people in the network are here. So welcome. If I, I won't be able to see your face, but welcome, parent to parent um, staff, parents supporters and fans. So thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off and turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks so much, Marsha, and welcome, everybody. Uh, and really, thank you all for joining us. This is the third of our series. And Marsha's correct. This, like the last webinar, is about practicalities. You learned in the first webinar the why of supported decision making, why it can help and why you should consider it and ways it can improve people's lives in theory. What the last two, and especially this one, is about are ways to go from theory to practice, to use the things we've learned so far to improve the life experiences of people with disabilities in these two areas, healthcare and what I call life planning, things like finances and others, so that we can maximize people's opportunities and maximize their quality of life. So let's begin with an article of faith, and it goes like this. People with disabilities have the same rights as everyone else. It's such an interesting thing to say because it's so obvious, but on your screen is a quote from the Americans with Disabilities Act that was the first time that was said in American history. Now note that the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. So 214 years after the Declaration of Independence said we're all created equal with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness rights. It wasn't until 1990 that Congress said that people with disabilities have the same rights. And how do we get to exercise those rights? What makes our quality of life quality? And it's self-determination, like we've talked about before. Self-determination is just a fancy way of saying control over your life, making choices. People who are self-determined do things instead of having things done to them. They make choices instead of having other people make choices for them. And what we know from about 40 years of studies and study after study after study has found this, that when people with disabilities have more self-determination, when they make more choices, when they have more control over their lives, their lives are measurably better. We have found repeatedly that people with disabilities with more self-determination are more likely to be independent, to be healthier, to be employed, to live where they want to live, to have the kind of lives they want. So we can get to self-determination by using supported decision-making. Definition of supported decision-making on your screen. And if you've ever heard me speak, you know I don't like this definition even though I wrote it. What I want you to think about when we think about supported decision making is this. When we use supported decision making, we get help doing the things we need to do to make the decisions we need to make in our lives. In other words, it's exactly what everyone does all the time. 
supported decision making is nothing more or less than doing what people without disabilities do every day. If you're a person without disabilities, think about the ways you've used supported decision making. Think about the people in your life who you go to for advice. Think about the times you sought out someone who you thought knew something that you didn't so you could learn how to do it. Think about the times you've asked doctors to explain things in plain language. Whenever you do that, Whenever you're getting help to understand what you need to understand and do what you need to do, you're using supported decision making. The difference is for people without disabilities, using that is natural and it's considered to be a good thing. Think about all our cliches. Make an informed choice. Don't make a snap judgment. Don't go off half cocked. They all mean the same thing. Get a second opinion. Get help. Use supported decision making. The difference for people with disabilities is that historically speaking, when they've said, I don't understand or help, society's looked at them as weak or less. And that has led to things like guardianship. It has led to things like segregation because people with disabilities are seen as not looking for the help we all need, but needing help even to exist. And I think that's dangerous. So a way that we can empower people with disabilities to use the exact same help that we all use is to make that commitment, is to use supported decision-making and see that supported decision-making for people with disabilities is just like it is for people without disabilities. We just have to commit to trying it. Now, for people with disabilities, it may be more intense, it may not. It may require different types of help. It may not. It may require longer term help. It may not. But if it does, that's okay too. Because if it works, if supported decision making is effective and empowers people to make their own decisions, then very good things can happen. That's what the research shows. We've got research now showing that when people use supported decision making to make their own decisions, their self determination increases. And that's incredibly important because like you've heard me say, and like you'll hear me say a million times, self-determination is the key to a better life for people with disabilities. We just had a study this year. I believe it was published in February of this year from a project we did in Virginia. We worked with young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities all across the spectrum of abilities uh, of, of about a 15 year age gap. Some were under guardianship, some were not. Some were nonverbal, quote unquote, others were more traditionally verbal. And what we did was we empowered them to use supported decision making in ways that best suited them. We talked to them about getting help. We talked to them about making plans. We talked to them about getting supporters, then said, go work with your family, work with your friends and tell us how you want to do this. And then they came back and they had all different types of plans in different ways, but they were things that worked for them to do what one of our participants said was, to say who we want help from, what kind of help we want, how they're gonna help us and when they're gonna help us. And she said, that's it. This one young woman made a chart. She'd written her own chart. And you know what? That is it. That's what supported decision-making is. And we followed those participants for about a year, did interviews with them, interviews with their family members, interviews with their supporters. And what we found across the board was that regardless of abilities, quote unquote, regardless of whether they were in guardianship or not, regardless of anything, across the board, when they used supported decision-making, their lives got better. They were more independent. They were more confident. They were better at making decisions. And according to the people in their lives, they made better decisions. And even in the middle of a pandemic, they said they had better lives. So that's what supported decision-making can do. And that's why it's been so popular and so endorsed by so many entities, the U S department of health and human services, the American bar association, the national guardianship association and disability specific groups like the artistic self advocacy network, the ARC, NAMI, this group, parent to parent, and so many others have said, this can be something that helps people. This can be something that builds to better lives. This can be something that can make our family members, our children, the people we care about, have the quality of life that we've always wanted for them. But the problem is this, even with everything I just said, what we know is that people with disabilities tend to get the worst healthcare. They are often, more often misdiagnosed or undertreated or overtreated. They get the wrong medication. They get too much medication. They don't get the treatment they need. And it's possible because 
We have doctors who don't communicate very well or doctors that are recommending guardianship. Doctors are one of the leading referral sources to tell people to get guardianship. And many times what I hear doctors say is I can't work with a person with disabilities. I can't work with a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities because that person cannot give me informed consent. Well, according to the American Medical Association, informed consent is the heart of the doctor-patient relationship. It's the most important part of the doctor-patient relationship. So without informed consent, a doctor can't treat a patient. So, so many times I've heard doctors say that means we can't work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities because just because of the disability, we know they can't give informed consent. So I always challenge doctors and I say, think about what informed consent really means. There's three parts, again, according to the American Medical Association. To give informed consent, the patient has to talk to the doctor, has to find some way to help the doctor understand what's going on. What are my symptoms? The doctor then gives information to the patient that the patient has to understand about what the recommendation is, what medication you should take, what course of treatment you should take, what you should do. The person has to understand that. Then the person chooses what to do, whether to take that medication, whether to do that surgery, whether to do what the doctor says and tells the doctor. That's informed consent, communication at every level, patient to doctor, doctor to patient, patient back to doctor with understanding at each of those levels. Well, that means that each of those levels is an opportunity for supported decision-making. Even as simple as explain that to me in plain language, I shouldn't use plain English. Uh, I should use plain language and check that from now on because that means you're helping you're getting what you need to understand. I say that to the doctor, please don't talk jargon. Tell me really what I need to know. Because if doctors say you can't understand, you lack capacity, you can't consent, what I always say to doctors is what's consent? What's capacity? At what level do you have to have understanding? Because our ability to make decisions isn't a yes or no question. It actually depends on the support we have. Here's a great example for that. Unless you are a doctor or you are a medical professional, you don't have the capacity to take care of your health. What do I mean by that? This, unless you can diagnose yourself and prescribe medication, you can't take care of your health. Unless you've got a doctor you know, or a medical professional you go to, or someone you talk to. It's going to the doctor and getting the doctor's help to understand your health care so that you can decide what to do that empowers you to take care of your health care. So your capacity to consent to surgery is not the same as your capacity to perform the surgery. You just need to have an understanding of what you need so you can agree to it or not. And that's why every level of this informed consent process is a chance for supported decision making. It's a chance for doctors and patients to work together so that doctors can have improved communication and methods that can be flexible, that can work in real time, and that can have the role of family and friends and supporters for the person. That's supported decision making. Like the Administration for Community Living in the US Department of Health and Human Services says, there's different ways for every person. There's different ways to do this. Remember, there's no one way to use supported decision making. You empower the person to get the person to understand best. So again, in that informed consent process, there may be different ways to facilitate that understanding at each approach. Think of it this way. If we use supported decision making at that first level, people who might not be able to understand what their doctors said can now have a supporter help them understand, help them make that decision, not make it for them, but help them understand what they need to understand so they can make that decision. So a person who might otherwise not be able to provide informed consent can. Put another way, a person who might not be able to make decisions on his or her own and maybe need a guardian with support can make that decision and be more independent, be more self-determined and manage their health care. At the second level, doctors 
who might have otherwise not treated someone, might have recommended guardianship or might have recommended commitment, will be able to communicate effectively with patients. We'll be able to talk with them, understand them, make sure that the patient understands them and have better outcomes. And by the way, studies show exactly that. Studies show that when doctors communicate better with patients, the patients have better outcomes. They're more healthy. They live longer, higher success rates, and doctors have less burnout. And at that last level, family members, friends, and supporters can be directly involved with the person they care about, with that person's permission, of course, and have an effective working relationship with the doctor and with the patient that, going back to the first bullet, empowers that person to be the self-determined driver of his or her health care. And what do we know about self-determination? It leads to better lives. So all of this works together using the supported decision-making in the healthcare relationship serves multiple levels. People get better health care. They have better lives. Doctors have better results. Friends and family members are more involved. And what I hear all the time from doctors when I explain this is, I can't do that. I can't have a supporter in the room. HIPAA prevents that. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act says I can't have a supporter in the room. And you know what I say to doctors then? I say every time I go to the doctor, I mean every time, just like you, I have to fill out a form. I have to fill out what's called a HIPAA release. And if you read that HIPAA release and all of that language, what it comes down to is the doctor is telling me that the doctor, because of HIPAA, can't share my personal information, my medical information with anyone else. So doctors always say, HIPAA stops me from sharing your personal information so we can't have a supporter. Then I say, but at the bottom of the form, there's a space for me to say who you can share that information with. I can give you permission to share information with someone. You know why? Because HIPAA belongs to me. The right to privacy belongs to me not to the doctor. So I can say, doctor, I want you to protect my right to privacy, but I want you to share my information with my friend, my mother, my brother, my wife, whoever. And we can all do that on the HIPAA form. So what is supported decision-making other than sharing information? You can use that HIPAA release. You can write on it. You can release information to Jonathan and you can write on it for the purpose of helping me make decisions. And just like that, you've created a supported decision-making, legally recognized, legally enforceable form. Or you can use your own form. You can write up, doctor, I give you permission to share information with Jonathan. Or you can go to supporteddecisionmaking.org. We have a resource library. You can use one of the forms that's been used around the country. Either way, remember this, supported decision-making like HIPAA belongs to you. You have the power to say, I want to do this with my doctor. I want the doctor to do this with me. So HIPAA doesn't say doctors can't use supported decision-making. What HIPAA says is doctors can only use supported decision-making with the person's permission. That's what supported decision-making is after all. It's giving permission to use supported decision-making. So HIPAA doesn't belong to the doctor. Remember that. We hear lots about HIPAA. HIPAA belongs to you. You can give the doctor permission to use supported decision-making. I can say, I want you to protect my privacy and not share it with anyone except these three people. Or I bring a person in. I can bring my wife to the doctor and sign the release to have her name in it and then say, I want you to put this in my file so every time I come, you know that I'm bringing my wife. And just like that, HIPAA still exists, but you have given permission for that one person to be on your team. That's what sharing information and supported decision-making is all about. I mean, go back to that informed consent idea. Information from the patient to the doctor, information from doctor to patient, doctor communicates, person understands, person makes a decision. Think about all of the levels of that in supported decision-making. I share information with my doctor about my symptoms. If I have a person with me, if I have difficulty communicating, that person can help the doctor understand what I'm saying. 
what my symptoms are, can help me if I'm having trouble communicating my symptoms, be able to communicate them, can cue me, can support me. The doctor then can understand me better. And when the doctor shares information back with me, my supporter can help me understand it by walking me through it, by breaking it down slowly, by doing whatever I need to understand it better, the supporter can then help me make the decision, maybe go through the pros and cons of it, maybe think about maybe help think about whether I should do it, whether I shouldn't do it. And once I make that decision, my supporter can help me communicate it. In other words, at every step of the process, there is the opportunity for support. Marsha, did you have a question? Yeah, Sherry in the chat box said, what if your doctor's office is not aware of this procedure? You know what? To me, one, you can educate the doctor by providing some resources like we have now. But number two, whether the doctor knows it's called supported decision making or not is irrelevant. You simply have the right to share information with anyone you want. And you can do that with the HIPAA form. My thing, I would always try to talk to the doctor in advance. If we're going to have a written form giving permission, I would give it in advance. But even so, if I have to go to the doctor like urgent care because my kid's sick or something, I would bring and I'd fill out the HIPAA form properly. And I would say, if my child is an adult, have my child sign it and give permission for me to be there with him or whoever my child wants to bring. So to me, it's an opportunity. It's always a good thing to educate the doctor in advance. But if there's no time in advance, just use the HIPAA form as the right to to work right through that. And if they don't allow that, you know, that's going to be a problem for that doctor. So uh, I, th- I would suggest you find someone like me um, uh, or someone to educate the doctor a little more forcefully. <laughs> okay. So what we do, like I said, is we can add language. This goes right to that question. We can write it up and everyone here has access to this PowerPoint. Feel free to share my language steal my language, to use my language. I authorize you to share my information with Jonathan to help me understand and make decisions. I also authorize Jonathan to attend my medical appointments to help me understand and make medical decisions. That is called a waiver or it's called an authorization and doctors use those all the time. So using something like that should not be surprising. And if it is a problem, like I said, there needs to be a conversation had with those doctors. We can create forms. You can create these things in advance. Here is language that you could write up and give to the doctor. And again, feel free to use my language. The quote at the bottom, I authorize Jonathan to work with me to help me understand, make and communicate my own medical decisions. I intend for Jonathan to be treated as I would with respect to my rights regarding the use and disclosure of my records. We even quote HIPAA here. And just like that, you're giving that doctor notice that HIPAA belongs to you and that you want the doctor to share with that person. Because again, what is supported decision making other than sharing information? There's other ways to do it. We can do powers of attorney. And I'm a big fan of powers of attorney because people know what they are. (laughs) Powers of attorney are now part of our culture. About 15 years ago, they weren't. There was a big push for powers of attorney, but now they're more understandable. We can write a power of attorney that includes supported decision-making. I mean, what does a power of attorney do? Power of attorney says, God forbid something happens to me. I want someone else to make decisions for me. I want you because I trust you to make decisions for me. Well, we can put put supported decision-making in a power of attorney. We can say, God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions, but here's how you're going to make them. Look at the bold language. I'm giving you, my agent, the power to make certain decisions on my behalf, but you agree to give primary consideration to what I want when you make those decisions, or you have to talk to me, or here are some decisions you can never make. I never, never consent to electric shock therapy. I never consent to Haldol or certain medication, or I always want extreme life-saving measures taken, or I never want those taken. You can make those decisions in advance as part of a power of attorney. You can specify how your power of attorney makes those decisions. We can do that in what's called an advanced directive as well, which is generally a power of attorney for healthcare. And again, look at the language we use. We can say in this, 
here are decisions I want you to make, and here's how I want you to make them. But if I have not previously told you that, if it's not in the agreement, then in making any decisions, you have to talk to me first. And the decision you make, you have to give primary considerations to what I want. And if I can't discuss this with you because I'm, I'm that um, incapacitated, the decision you make should be one that I would make, not that what you think is best. You have to think about what you know about me and say, this is what Jonathan would do. And just like that, even though we're giving someone else the power to make certain decisions like medical decisions, we are empowering the person to be maximally in control of his or her health care, which, as we know, increases self-determination, which is better for quality of life. So think about other ways we can use language, other ways we can put in an advanced directive. What if we want to say, God forbid something happens to me, I want you to make decisions for me. But in the meantime, I want you to help me. We can create an advanced directive that includes very specific supported decision making. Here's one right here. I'm giving you the power to work with me. God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions for me. But at other times, when you don't have power to make decisions, when I'm not incapacitated, I want you to come to the doctor with me to support me, to make sure I'm able to understand my decisions and I'm able to make those decisions. That's an enforceable power of attorney or advanced directive. You can take that to your doctor and say, this proves I want my mother, my brother, whoever to come with me. And this is a legal document authorizing it. Marsha? Yeah, a couple in the chat box here, the Q&A. Uh, Sherry had a mention of not seeing the lines on a HIPAA form in, in past. And I'd recommend what Jonathan said, going to www.supporteddecisionmaking.org, where there are forms that you could basically customize yourself if you're not seen on a HIPAA form at the office, if I'm not correct, Jonathan, is that what yeah, you would recommend? We could, but I've never seen a HIPAA form that doesn't have at the bottom a specific area where you authorize the doctor to release information to a specific person. Okay. And usually, often I get asked that also. I, mean, I, I have, my children are 11. And when I go to the doctor, we go to urgent care or whatever, they always ask me, who should I release these records to besides you? It's like, is it your pediatrician? Is it whoever? And the HIPAA form we always sign, it's usually near the end where it says, I authorize release to these persons. So I can authorize release when I go to the doctor to my wife or whoever I want. But that's a place for us to authorize release to our supporter. It's specifically authorized. that I think you'll find it at the bottom of most HIPAA forms. And I know it's buried underneath all the jargon. And then Stephanie just had a comment. Thank you so much. My son, who's almost 21, she did this successfully by accident, and she didn't realize that she was actually using supported decision-making. So, I think that's the best comment I've heard all day, and I've been. this is my third webinar of the day. So I think that's awesome, but it's not an accident. It's not an accident at all, because who calls it supported decision-making? We just call it life. You empowered your child. You did the right thing. The fact that it also has a name, I hope someday it doesn't have a name. I hope we're not talking about supported decision-making 10 years from now. We're just talking about making decisions because we all make decisions this way. So thank you very much for that, Stephanie. Now, next, think about other areas in healthcare where we can use supported decision-making. If you're working with any kind of Medicaid supports and services, a Medicaid waiver, Medicaid, or things like Centers for Independent Living or Aging and Disability Resource Centers, places that get federal funding, they're going to be required to use person-centered planning. What I've pulled from you on screen comes directly from the person-centered planning material that the federal government puts out. So when you do a person-centered plan for Medicare, for Medicaid, for a waiver, that's supposed to be a plan that addresses your supports and your services in a way that reflects what you want, your preferences and your goals. And it's supposed to cover all kinds of things in life, like your community participation, your health care, employment, income, wellness, education, savings. So a person-centered plan is incredibly broad. It's a life plan. 
But the key to a person-centered plan, what we always see, and the guidance given is that, that, that providers are supposed to take the time and work with the person to find out what's important to the person and for the person, what kind of strengths the person has, what kind of interests the person has, what the person likes to do and doesn't, the kind of life the person wants to have, the activities the person wants to uh, be a part of, the people the person wants in his or her life, and that person's goals or objectives. And the counselor is supposed to give the person information back and forth so that I understand my choices. I understand what my options are for employment, my options are for healthcare, my options are for activities. And because my counselor has taken the time to get to know me, I can now work with my counselor to make the decisions about what kind of supports and services I want. Doesn't that sound just like supported decision-making? What you're gonna see, what you saw in prior webinars in ways like IEPs in special education are just a form of supported decision-making, or individualized plans for employment in vocational rehabilitation are just a type of supported decision making. The same is true for what we just saw. Informed consent is just like supported decision making. Person-centered planning is just like supported decision making. So using these and using supported decision making, we can ensure that people get individually based and focused supports and services in a way that empowers the person to make decisions to the maximum of their ability, which means not only are we finding supports and services, we're building abilities, we're building self-determination. And I say again and again and again, when people have more self-determination, they have better lives. So we're moving forward and there's very specific things that you can do in Medicaid. If you have a child and that child receives Medicaid, and I'm being 21 years age or under, so up to age 21, children who get Medicaid, whether it's through regular Medicaid or a waiver or any kind of Medicaid program, if you're a parent of a child getting that, then these are the five most important letters you're ever going to hear. EPSDT, and no one ever is told enough about them. So I want to spend some time on this particular Medicaid program. So EPSDT stands for Early and Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. And a couple of things I want you to know about EPSDT first. The whole point of EPSDT is to catch, address, and deal with problems early. So the idea is to catch stuff when kids are young before it gets worse and impacts them when they're adults. First. Second. It's available to anyone who's getting Medicaid, whether it's through a state plan option, an HMO, a waiver. If you're getting Medicaid, you're getting EPSDT. You do not need to enroll in it. You do not need to ask about it. EPSDT is just another name for Medicaid when we're dealing with people under 21. So don't think you have to enroll or apply. Your kid's getting it if your yes. kid is getting Medicaid. And here's the big deal about it, okay? The whole point of EPSDT is this. Here's how Medicaid works. I have to give you a little background. So Medicaid works this way. The federal government goes to a state. I use Illinois in this example. I know that people are here from all across the country or New York, wherever it is. Let's say New York. The federal government comes to New York and says, New York, I have a lot of money for you if you want to be part of Medicaid, do you? And every state is part of Medicaid. But when New York says, yes, I do want to be part of Medicaid, I want that money, what the federal government says is, okay, you can have the money, but here's a bunch of things you have to do. Here are services and supports you have to provide. I always call that column A, like a menu. The federal government then says, New York, I have more money for you if you want it, and if you take it, there are things here you have to do. You don't have to take this money. You can keep doing Medicaid and doing all the column A stuff. I'm offering you extra money to do these other column B stuff. You don't have to take it. Some states take the column B, some don't. If you're getting Medicaid, column A you have to do, column A you may do if you want. Got it? That's how Medicaid works. States have to provide column A and can, if they want to, provide column B. Example is in my home state of Virginia, dental care is a column B thing. 
States don't have to provide it. They can take money and provide it, but they don't have to. For years and years and years, Virginia did not do dental care. They only just started. So when I was doing a lot of work in Virginia, the only dental care covered by Medicaid was teeth pulling. So there were people with disabilities with no teeth. There were group homes and institutions when they were still very full in Virginia, full of people with no teeth. It was the only thing Medicaid covered. So Medicaid, so dental care was a column B issue that Virginia said we're not doing. They had to do A. Here's how EPSDT works. If you're a kid, if you're under 21, getting Medicaid, then anything your state could cover, they have to cover whether or not they do. So for kids 21 and under getting Medicaid, they are entitled to everything in column A and everything in column B. If a state could do it, they have to do it for a young adult. And that is hugely important because there are things that are being done around the country that are fascinating that some states don't cover. Well, for kids, they have to. I had a number of Medicaid trials where I went in carrying other states' Medicaid handbooks to show this is being done in West Virginia. This is being done in Texas. This is being done in Illinois. You got to do it. It's EPSDT. So that's the magic of EPSDT. Anything that could be covered must be covered. So now think as broadly as you can about all the supports and services you wish your child had. As we've been discussing supported decision-making, if your child has a disability that impacts his or her ability to make decisions, then ESDT would cover supports and services to help that. EPSDT would do that because any kind of thing that can be covered and called medical care, any therapy, any treatment, any, any course of conduct that can, we can call medical is going to be covered by EPSDT. In fact, anything that will correct a problem, that will, that will help a problem or keep a problem from getting worse is going to be covered under EPSDT. That's the magic of it. So if you're getting Medicaid, you can use it for amazing things. In fact, you can use it in school. Because if you have a student in school receiving special education, and that student's getting Medicaid, and the school then fills out the paperwork to be a Medicaid provider, then anything medical in the IEP is covered. EPSDT can be magic in that way. I mean, think about if you're a parent and you've got a child in special education, you've heard a million times or you've heard the horror stories where you know that your child has an issue that needs therapy or needs treatment or needs technology, needs wraparound services, needs more than what's being offered. And the school says, yeah, we don't really see that problem here. That must be a home problem. Or no, we think the two hours of occupational therapy is enough. That's really the school's way of saying we don't want to pay for it. Under EPSDT, if the school becomes a Medicaid provider, then EPSDT pays for it. Anything that's medical that goes in the IEP, and we can make anything seem medical, any therapy, any treatment, any technology is going to be paid for by Medicaid. So EPSDT can absolutely move you forward. But supported decision making is not just about healthcare. It's also about life. It's about moving forward in life. In fact, anything that requires decision-making has an opportunity to use supported decision-making. Consider money. Financial planning and money is the number two reason I hear for guardianship. Number one reason I was here is safety. Number two reason that I was here is my kid needs a guardian because they can't handle money. And that may be true. And if it is true, guardianship's fine. But there are ways that we can empower people using supported decision-making, if possible, to make their own decisions. Here's a good one we did. I worked with an 18-year-old. Um, his mom had seen me speak and was convinced she was going to need to get a guardianship. But her said, you know what? Now that I've heard about this, maybe I don't want this guardianship. But I'm still worried my kid's going to get ripped off or swindled. And the kid was pretty self-aware. He said, you know, I may not be able to handle money very well. By the way, he was 18. Who does handle money well at 18? But he was particularly sensitive to that he might get swindled. So what we did was we worked on a power of attorney. That said to this kid, 
here is a certain amount of money. I think it was 50 bucks a week or something. Use it, go nuts. Learn what it's like to make decisions, make mistakes, make good choices, make bad choices, understand what it means to manage your money. But if you want to spend any more than that, your mom is going to have to agree. Meaning if you want to buy a car or sell a car for $20,000, you have to go through your mom because she's your agent. But here's the good part. Look at the bottom of your screen in the bold language. What we said is before mom makes that decision, she's got to have a conversation with the kid. She has to give ex consideration to why he wants to spend that money or why he wants to do that thing. You know why? Because he might be right and he might be wrong. And if he's wrong, it's a chance for the mother to educate him, to talk about budgeting, to talk about money management. So his skills get built. We did the same thing about banking. Back when people actually used to write checks, we said you can write a check for this much. Anything more than that, the mother has to sign off on. So we had it written on the check. More than X amount requires two signatures. We see that on business checks. And we said exactly that. If you want to withdraw more and we can put spending limits on a debit card, you have to get mom's okay. But again, we said, before you decide whether or not to okay that, before you decide I'm not signing that check, you have to hear him out. You have to understand why he wants to do that thing, because he might be right. And if he's wrong, you have a chance to provide education. So that can do with money management, because money management is so important. We don't give it enough thought, I, I think. Because when we talk about things like community integration and independence, when we're truly talking about being parts of our community, that requires really thinking about how we interact and when we interact and where we interact. I mean, I always say if community integration is just the right not to live in an institution and the right to live in an apartment where you never go anywhere or do anything, what's the point, Marsha? Yeah, I, I just had a comment from Josh that we also talk about joint bank accounts for people as well. Sure. And we're, we're about to talk about that a little bit more in the context of another specific type of account. But yes, it's an opportunity to help manage money and help guide while maximizing independence. Can I go back one step, Jonathan? Sure. I, I want to um, answer these questions more live than, than going back at the end. Um, when we were talking about the HIPAA and the release of information and, and empowering our children or adults in the, in the waiting room or in the doctor's office, um, Susan said she has more problems with insurance companies not talking to her about her 20-year-old son. She uh, had him initially sign a HIPAA form and they talked to me. He always seemed to lose it in his file. And sometimes she just puts on the speaker on call and, and has her son say yes during it sounds like during a telehealth visit um, that she can talk to them. And that sounds frustrating. It is frustrating. It's a good strategy. I often recommend that people, now that we can scan anything on our phones, is do a PDF scan on your phone of any kind of important information. So if the insurance company has lost the form yet again, I'm able to say, okay, what's your email or what's your text? And I'll get it to you right now. That's not something you should have to do, but it's very clear that sometimes we've got to go that extra step because we can't always presume that people are doing the best job. And then there was one more from Andrea, Andrea Richardson. What's the best way to advise parents who are on the fence about their child's guardianship? I, and this is not a question dodge. I have to say this immediately. I'm not dodging this question. But what I always say is this, I never tell parents what to say or what to do because I don't know their situation. I don't know their child and I'm not going to diagnose or, or <laughs> tell someone what to do. I don't think that's fair. I am perfectly happy to get to know you and talk with you and give you advice. But here's my basic advice is don't rush. Guardianship is always an option. It always, it's never going anywhere. There's always going to be the opportunity to get guardianship. But given what we know about self-determination, given what we know about the benefits of it, given what we know about the rights and how important they are, and given what we know about the science, that we know we've got all this science that says having self-determination makes for a better life and losing it makes for a worse life, then don't rush into guardianship. Think about what you might be able to do to empower 
and try it. Or consider things like powers of attorney or advanced directives that allow you to have some legal power, but also maximize the child's uh, decision making. And finally, if guardianship is right, and sometimes it's absolutely the right thing to do, limit it just to the areas where it's truly needed. Judges like to give full guardianship. It's kind of their default because it's easier to check all the boxes than to figure out which box to check. Don't do that. I mean, unless the child truly can't make any decisions. If, if, if you want guardianship and you need guardianship as guardianship is right, then it should be limited to just the areas it's truly needed. So you have time to explore, you have time to think, and you can prepare from a younger age about this. So I always talk about schools, you know, using supported decision-making as early as pre-K. It's a skill. It's an independent living skill. Um, I talked about that in our last webinar. So again, my basic advice, don't rush. Think. Think about the kind of life you want for your child and see if there is a way to do that without taking the child's rights away. And beyond that, I'm happy to talk to you and, and learn more from you so I can give better advice than just the really basic stuff. Okay, so moving forward, again, think about what brings us into our communities. Like I said, being part of a community is doing things. It's not just staying in your house all day. So it's not where I live, it's how I live. And that's a huge deal. Because if you get public benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, SSI, SSDI, there's a problem. And the problem identified by Forbes magazine of all places is that people with disabilities have a really hard time having a decent quality of life when they're on public benefits. Public benefits often are the things that help them stay alive. That's your Medicaid. That's your health care. That's the things that help you be independent. The problem is you, you don't have opportunities to have actual money and do things. All of the things you see on your screen. IRAs, savings accounts, medical accounts are things that are available to people without disabilities or people not getting benefits. There are ways for us to save money. There are ways for us to have things for our future. But if you're getting public benefits, you can't have those things because the law says to get public benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, SSI, SSDI, you can't have more than $2,000 to your name. And I mean $2,000 of assets, not just cash. With very few exceptions, you're not allowed to have more than $2,000 of worth. And if you have more than that, you start losing or could lose entirely those benefits. So we call that a fiscal cliff, that means test, where I can't have more than $2,000. Think about what that does to people. It tells people you can't work. And that is one of the biggest things I hear. My child can't work. He'll lose his benefits. I can't help my kid with rent or any kind of support. My kid will lose his benefits. We can't do these things. They'll lose their benefits. So you know, we have to spend down assets. Basically, you have to be broke or you'll lose benefits. So the irony is the things that keep you alive, your benefits, are the things that keep you from having a life. Not anymore. I want to talk to you about a savings account that if you don't know about, you should. It's called an ABLE account. It stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. That is the, the law that passed it. ABLE, the whole point of ABLE is to help people with disabilities have money so they can have a life. Okay, if you've ever heard of a 529 account for education, a 529 account where you, you can put money away, it grows tax-free, and then if it's taken out for education purposes, it's tax-free. Well, think about an ABLE account as a 529 for life. It actually is called a 529 account. That's the section of the tax code. But the ABLE account lets you put up to $15,000 a year into an account. And that money does not count against your benefits. So it doesn't count against that $2,000 you're allowed to have. So you can put 15,000 into an account every year and that money grows tax free and you can take it out at any point to spend on things you want to spend it on to have the best quality of life. And the good news is, is it can grow tax free. And as long as you have less than $102,000 in that account, 
it has no impact on your benefits. If you have $101,999, you still get your SSI and you still get your Medicaid. If you have $102,001, your SSI, SSDI will likely either be suspended or cut, but you will still get your Medicaid. You can learn more about ABLE programs. Every state has one. You're not required to use your state's program. You can look around and see if another state has a better program. There's a great website for this called ABLE NRC, the ABLE National Resource Center. So ABLE NRC. Dot org. And to have an ABLE account, what you need to do to qualify is either be receiving SSI or SSDI, or you would get it if you applied, you just haven't applied yet. So a doctor could certify that this person would get SSDI if he or she was eligible for it. It's a way to kind of hedge your bets. The example of that is my niece is on the autism spectrum. My brother has set up an ABLE account for her, but has not applied for SSDI. The hope is that she can work and be independent and do the things she needs to do. But if she has to go on disability, the ABLE account is there. Okay, so that's how that works. Be eligible or you would have been eligible if you applied. And it's pretty simple to apply. You can say with a certification from a doctor, if you're not getting SSDI, the doctor would say you would have gotten it. You can get lots more information about this again, ablenrc.org. And on your screen right now are lots of tiny words. The reason those words are tiny is because these are all of the things you can use an ABLE account for. And the answer is you can use it for anything. The point is to give people an experience like everyone else. So anything for education, housing, employment, health, transportation, anything for life necessities, clothing, re recreation, trips, things like that. I, I can't frankly think of anything you can't use an ABLE account for. So what ABLE does is it can give you a pathway. Okay, this doesn't work for everyone, but I've seen it work. So consider this. Like I said, because of the fiscal cliff, people have been terrified to work for fear of losing their benefits. So someone learns about an ABLE account and gets a job that she wouldn't have gotten had she not known about ABLE because she was afraid for benefits. She makes some money. She puts it in her ABLE account. She later takes some money out of that ABLE account to pay for education or job training, which helps her get a better job, which helps her make more money, which she can put in the ABLE account, some of which she could take out to pay for things like transportation or training or more education, which could lead to a better job. And they can follow that path to the point where maybe they don't need benefits anymore. Uh, I know of one young woman who started making minimum wage as a temporary worker in a hospital and followed this path and got enough promotions and enough full-time jobs that she's now a full-time employee with benefits. So she no longer needed SSDI or Medicaid and is now kind of free to have the life that she wants to have. Will that work for everyone? No. Is it worth looking into? Absolutely. Because whether or not you work your way off benefits, you have something when you have benefits so that you can have life experiences like other people. And here's the great thing about ABLE accounts. You may have heard about special needs trusts. And a special needs trust works kind of like ABLE in that it doesn't count against your benefits either. But the difference is, in a special needs trust, the trustee controls the money. You have to ask the trustee for money for something. In an ABLE account, it's the person who has the account that controls the account. So the person with disabilities with the ABLE account is in charge of that account, has to decide how the money will be used, when it's deposited, and how it will be spent. That's because the purpose of ABLE is to help people with disabilities have a better life experience be healthier, be more independent, have a better quality of life. And what we know about quality of life is that self-determination leads directly to it. So ABLE accounts are a way to use supported decision-making to build self-determination. With ABLE accounts, a person who's in charge of the account can name someone else to support them with that account. There are several states that let you even define levels like, I want to give this person level one, which means they can see my balance. So if I'm overspending, that person can give me advice. 
Level two might be this person can deposit into my account. Level three might be deposit and withdraw to manage the account. Level four might be make all decisions with regard to the account. So what the person wants, the type of support the person wants can go hand in hand with the ABLE account. So supported decision making can work throughout the money management process. A person can say, I want Jonathan to have access to the account and we can specify how. If Jonathan sees I'm spending more than X per month, I want him to advise me. Or I want to go farther than that. If I've spent more than X, Jonathan can freeze the account if that's what the person wants. So we can use supported decision making with ABLE to help the person have the experiences while also having the self-determination to build their quality of life. And supported decision making keeps going. It goes all the way through life. When I work with people on powers of attorney, for example, the 18 year old I talked to you about finances, we always included what I call a growth clause, where every year we were gonna take a deep dive onto this power of attorney to see how it was working, whether it was still needed. The goal there, remember, we said you could spend $50 a week without mom's okay. The idea was if he was doing better, we could up that to 75 or $100. If you're doing worse, we could ratchet it down to make sure he had the support he needed or was building the skills he could. The mother told me her ultimate goal was for him to have no restrictions on his spending, but he had to get there with her support, and then that would empower him to do that. And all the way through end-of-life planning, and I can't stress enough how, how important end of life planning is. Um, but there are processes out there like called the conversation and five wishes where you speak with a person in a facilitated process so the person can make end of life decisions. Everything from whether they want a burial or cremation to whether they want extraordinary measures taken to save their lives or hospice care. And I've always talked to people about this and how people are reluctant to talk about end of life planning because it's, it's, it sounds icky. But in actuality, it's a great chance to build self-determination. And I know that from my father, who, when he was nearing his end, <laughs> got some control over his life, over something that no one has control over, by simply deciding what readings and music he wanted. It gave him a little more control over something. And we know that life control is good. So this is a chance to talk to people about their journey and what they want in their journey and how they want it so that maybe there'll come a time when they can't make those decisions, we'll have a record of what they wanted. Marsha? There's a, a timely question here. So Susan Bullig, she says, I refuse to do guardianship for my son because I would not let a judge say that he was incompetent. He really cannot make his own medical decisions or money decisions, but he loves to tell us where he wants to go and eat and what video games he wants to buy. I was able to find an attorney to do a medical POA. We were able to have our son say he wanted mom and dad to take him to his doctors. My biggest concern is if we die and we did guardianship, the next person doing his care could make any decisions they wanted and might not be what our son wants. Can we add some supported decision making to the medical POA? Absolutely. You can always amend the POA. I would talk to the lawyer you had. But I want to commend you also on being actually really insightful. Um, statistically speaking, this is the first generation of people with disabilities who are likely to outlive their parents. So the guardianship conversation has to include what you just said is what happens after. You can't leave guardianship in a will. You know, um, the judge is the ultimate guardian and the judge will appoint a new guardian. And it might be someone who doesn't do things the way that you do. It might be someone who doesn't believe in the things that you believe in. So people always ask, what's the difference between a power of attorney and guardianship? They both give someone else the power to make decisions. The difference is in a power of attorney, we can say how those decisions will be made and what I want to do in the future. So for example, with a power of attorney, not only can you add that supported decision-making language, you can add backup supporters. You can say, I have written a power of attorney with as many as four to say, if this person isn't available or is gone, this person becomes the power of attorney. Or I want this person for this kind of decisions, that person for other kinds of decisions. You can build in tiers of support so that you always have someone who could be there. 
That's the kind of conversation I think you have to have early and build through. But I think that's a great idea. And it gives you the option, the kind of peace of mind to know that a stranger will be far less likely to be making decisions about your child. So wrapping up, the last, the question I always get is, how can I be sure this is going to be safe? You know, Jonathan, I love the supportive decision-making idea, but can you guarantee me that the person is not going to get exploited or taken advantage of? And the answer is no, I can't. Uh, in fact, I'll guarantee you that right now someone is being taken advantage of by someone they trust, whether that person has a disability or not. We all get led astray. So no, there is no way I can guarantee that the supporter won't do that. On the other hand, I can tell you that I know of no study that has ever found that people in guardianship are safer or better off than people not in guardianship. In fact, the National Core Indicator study found that people not in guardianship are having better qualities of life than people with similar abilities and limitations who are in guardianship. Also, there are some horrific stories of guardianship abuse. So that's not to say guardianship is bad or guardians are bad. It's to say that some people are bad. And if there is the possibility for abuse or neglect in guardianship or in supported decision-making or in anything, then what I'm going to say is the one we should at least try, and this goes back to a question I had before, the one we should at least try is the one that is associated or correlated with supported with self-determination. Because we know that self-determination is correlated with better quality of life and better safety. So I'm going to try to build self-determination first. And if it doesn't work, guardianship's always there. But if I can help my kid to be more self-determined, which is going to lead to a better quality of life, according to all the science, that's probably the one we should at least try. And that's part of that, that is really the advice I've always given to parents. Again, I don't know your kid, but if you think it could be done, why not try and see what happens? It doesn't mean we turn away from abuse or neglect. There are signs that we should be paying attention to. In some states, everyone is a mandated reporter. So if we see abuse, neglect, if we see exploitation, if we suspect it, we should absolutely report it. But there's places we can report that whether or not a person is in guardianship. In one case I had, the Jenny Hatch case, the judge was very pro-guardianship because he said, I'll always be there. They can always come to me for help. And I, I put a witness on who listed like five, di five or six different agencies that could open an investigation in 24 hours if there was a problem. And I said to the judge, judge, can I get on your docket in 24 hours? And he scowled at me because he knew I was right. So guardianship doesn't make you any safer than not being in guardianship because the police and, and adult protective services and child protective services and your state's protection and advocacy system are going to be there whether or not a person is in guardianship. Last thoughts. Remember that bad decisions happen. And when we empower people to make decisions, they make make bad ones. All adults do. We may pick the wrong romantic partners. We may do unhealthy things. Lord knows I drink enough Diet Dr. Pepper to qualify for that. Bad decisions do not equal inability to make decisions. What a bad decision is, is a sign that a person needs more support. I consulted on a case yesterday where a person uh, with cerebral palsy, with no cognitive limitations, had run off to Texas to be with her boyfriend who she'd been dating for a year. Her mother wanted to get guardianship over her to keep her from going to Texas because it was a bad decision. And what I asked the attorney was, yeah, but maybe she loves him and maybe he's not a bad guy. And maybe it's not the best decision, but that's not the point. The point isn't who makes the best decision. It's can the person make decisions with or without support, even decisions we might not agree with. That's one of the most important things about supported decision making. We're not required to support someone to do something I don't believe in. If someone comes to me and I'm a supporter for some people and they want to do something, I don't, well, I don't think it's a good idea. I'll say I wouldn't do that. It's not illegal, but I wouldn't do it. I'm not sure that's the best decision. And if they say I'm still doing it, then I can just I, – I wish you wouldn't, but I'm not going to help you, but it's your right to make a bad decision. And sometimes that's what we have to 
do because people make bad decisions all the time. I've heard of people without disabilities moving cross country to be with someone they just met. Wasn't the best decision, but it was their right to do it. So if we keep these things in mind, if we look at what I call protecting, respecting, and projecting rights. If we believe in self-determination and we know that self-determination is the key to a better life, then supported decision-making is a way that we can empower people to have that. And that ought to be our goal. I told you before, I don't even want the word supported decision-making to, to be around. And I'm as guilty as anyone for popularizing it. But you know what I hope for? If we keep our eyes on that prize of self-determination, then someday we're not going to be talking about supported decision-making. We're going to be talking about people with disabilities and people without disabilities making decisions, having the same opportunities for success and security as everyone else, having their best quality health care, having their best quality life, and having the people in their lives who care about them helping them just like everyone else. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, on your screen right now is my email. Um, and it's important that we stay in touch if you're interested in having any questions, because I think it's important for us to have these conversations, because there will be things coming up if you do this that you'll be confused about. Reach out, talk to people, talk to me, talk to your family, talk to your friends about ways that we can build and work and explore together. Thank you so much, Marsha. I have one more um, comment question from somebody, Lisa Huckleberry. She's a single parent to a teenage daughter with Down syndrome, and she does not have many options for where she will live or who will take care of her after I die or die first. I'm hopeful she will be independent, but she will need someone to take over her POA. She's trying to do that over guardianship, but my best person to take over the POA is my sister, and she happens to be older than me. I may be able to add to my niece that this is really stressing me out. And I, I think that a lot of people on this call, I, our biggest fear is, well, it, our children outliving us and what will happen when we're not gone. Do you have anything to comment on that, Jonathan? I do. And it's, it's heartbreaking, I know. Um, um, I always say, if you know <laughs> when the hurricane is coming, and you know the hurricane is coming, you have two choices. You can hope it passes you by, or you can get your furniture off the lawn because that keeps you and your family safe. Death is something that is coming. It's inevitable. So metaphorically speaking, we need to plan as soon as possible. We need to find resources. And one place I'd recommend seeking resources is your community is going to have what's called a Center for Independent Living, or CIL. Uh, just Google Center for Independent Living in whatever county you live in. It will sh they are federally funded entities that help people plan and receive supports and services to be as independent as possible. That's one place to start because we can hopefully broaden the circle. I get asked about what we call the unbefriended all the time. What about people who don't have anyone in their lives? Well, if you're working with a person who has no family, if you're concerned that someone in your life has no family, we can work to broaden the circle. Go to a Center for Independent Living. Go to a support group. Look for a disability-specific organization. Look for social opportunities to help your family member, your loved one, have opportunities to build that circle, to look for additional or possibly new supporters. Uh, look for new resources and do that as early as possible. It's like I said, you're right to be worried. This generation of people with disabilities will outlive their caregivers. So we need to prepare for that as soon as possible. I know that's not a satisfactory answer because it's not an easy answer, mm -hmm. but I think it's the best one. It's make those plans and find those things as early as you can. I encourage everybody to look in the chat box. Um, there's the evaluation, if you don't mind completing that for us, archives of the previous two webinars and some supported decision-making forms that Jonathan has shared via his um, Burton Blatt Institute and supporteddecisionmaking.org. I will be sending out a recording of this to the entire P2P network uh, along with that survey, so I encourage you to complete it. Well, this is number three out of four. Our fourth will be about 
supported decision making in vocational rehabilitation and that's scheduled for November 18th at this same time 4 p.m. so you'll hear about that in October and I'm just every time I have one of these I, I walk away with an action item for myself to to do for my family or, or my son and I think um, today it's it's just nice to know that there's alternatives to guardianship and I think that should be one of our taglines here that you don't have to rush into it. Um, it's not for everybody and that the power of attorney um, talk we had today it was really educational Jonathan and thank you for talking as a teacher. Um, that's I feel like you're a professor on this subject and that you're teaching us and interacting with us at the same time so it's there's a lot of information um, but we we do appreciate having the slides to, to look back on if we if we need some information and I think uh, you said it that supported decision making isn't really what we're talking about. We're talking about self determination on all levels and, um, you know, through the lifespan and, and the different subjects that we're talking about, like IEPs and education and today with health care and, and planning for the future. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for number three webinar. You kicked it out of the park for number three on one day. I know it's late where you're at. So Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time and look forward to our next webinar in November. Do you have any closing remarks, I, I Jonathan? I do. Mostly thank you. Uh, I'm going to echo what Marcia said. I'm, I'm going to ask for you to do the evaluation. You'll see it in the chat box. I just posted it. It's also in a link from Celestia that says e eval is available at. The reason I'm asking you for that is we are funded for this project through the New York Developmental Disabilities Council. And they want to know if we're good at what we're doing. And the evaluation should take you about two minutes to do. And I'd really appreciate it if you do it. And if, if we didn't do something well, tell us. So we'll do it better next time. But with that, I'm looking forward to talking with you again in November. And I really appreciate your time. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions or just want to talk. Thank you very much.